So let's move on, because this event, of course, is for us to recognize young people who are making a difference in South Africa, and ultimately in the rest of the world, because every one person you help could help another person, and then it continues. And we can't get to where we are without academics. We all know that we can learn something, whether it's from a textbook at home, whether it's from your teacher in school, whether it's from your lecturers at university. But being great in South Africa does not mean you have to be a university student. And I'll disregard that entirely as a young person. I mean, I studied, but I know people who have not been to university, but have made a big name for themselves. And this, these awards don't just recognize people who have a degree or diploma. It recognizes people who are working in their fields regardless of what qualification they have. It really is about a personality, how you're driven, and the difference you're making in our society. Nevertheless, we will still like to hear from academics because, as Khadija put it, we can learn from somebody every single day. I learn from my colleagues, I learn from a petrol attendant who greets me and smiles no matter what. That inspires me to actually be a kind person to everyone I meet. Uh, we get so caught up in our daily lives, in being busy, in uh, getting to the next destination, in getting the next job done, that we forget to be polite to each other. And you go around the world, many people will tell you that South Africans are friendly people. We're friendly to people that we don't know. But to the people we do know, we don't make the effort. And I think that's the point, that we need to make the effort no matter what. So let's hear from the academic, who's actually delivering our keynote address tonight. And it is, of course, Professor Chelizi Marwala, the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Johannesburg. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Khadija and your Mail and Guardian team, uh, Tiko, Kentani, and the NetBank team. Uh, there's also a University of Johannesburg team that is uh, sitting at the back, and all nominees. I think we should give them a round of applause. You are young, but you are doing very, very well. In 2005, I appeared in the inaugural edition of the Mail and Guardian 100 Young South Africans. As a reward for this achievement, we were featured in the newspaper and we were taken to lunch at Nando's. <laughs> Amongst the young people who were featured in these hundred young South Africans, it was hundred at that time, was the now Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Town, Professor Mamu Heti Pakeng, as well as the Deputy Minister of Finance, Dr. David Masondo. Renewing and expanding hope, the Mail and Guardian hundred young South Africans has now evolved into the Mail and Guardian 200 young South Africans. Later on, the 200 South Africans who were included uh, in this list included my master student, Musizi Koza, who is a deputy chief of staff uh, to the CEO of APSA, and my former doctoral student, Professor Nero Mondo, who is now the executive director of the CSIR. Young people who are here today, you are on for greater things. But more dramatically, the young people who are honored here today live in the middle of a great revolution called the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Because of the extraordinary technological advances and changes that are happening around these young people, the skills, the prowess that is going to be required from you in order to tackle this very challenging time that we are entering is going to be immense. Now, what is this thing called the fourth industrial revolution? 
To understand the fourth industrial revolution, perhaps it is important for us to understand other industrial revolutions. The first industrial revolution happened in England in the 17th century. Why did it happen in England? Given the population size, the first industrial revolution perhaps was supposed to have happened in India or China, which had much bigger populations than England. I was a PhD student in England, and if you wander around to a pub in England, you will wonder why did it happen uh, in England? It happened in England rather than India or China because the scientific revolution, which was led by a 23-year-old, Isaac Newton, actually happened in England. Of course, this scientific revolution gave us the loss of motion, the loss of gravitation, and of course, it led to the first industrial revolution. The age of Newton, when he was most intellectually productive, was only 23 years old. And it is essential for the youth to realize they are at, the most, at their most productive stages of their lives. So seize this moment, be daring, be bold, and as former US President Rousseff well put it, and I quote, fear nothing but fear itself, close quote. You are never too young to lead. Go on and lead us. The first industrial revolution produced steam engines. It produced uh, mechanized ways of production. During this period in England, a group of people called the Luddites arose in an attempt to stop the first industrial revolution. Of course, they were defeated. Many of them were hanged and they were relegated to the dustbin of history as the first industrial revolution marched on. Those among our myths who are resisting the changes that are coming with the fourth industrial revolution do so at their own peril. I'm reminded of the words of Charles Kettering, who once noted, and I quote, the world hates change. Yet it is only, it is the only thing that has brought us progress, close quote. The second industrial revolution occurred mainly in the United States with the discovery of electricity by a British scientist called Michael Faraday. He did this at a tender age of 21. Faraday realized that moving an electric conductor which is located close to a magnet actually generates electricity. Up to today, the most popular way of producing electricity in the world is by moving conductors next to magnets. That's exactly what ESCOM actually does. They bend the coal that heats the water, that becomes steam, and that moves a big conductor that is located next to a magnet, and the electricity is generated. This is not witchcraft. It is scientific thinking. <laughs> the reverse to that is that when one puts a magnet close to a conductor and pass electricity through the conductor, it moves. This is what we call an electric motor. An electric motor is widely used in the assembly line, in our factories, to produce goods. And it gave us mass production of goods and services. Electricity and electric motors are produced using the principle called electromagnetism, which was the genesis of Einstein's theory of relativity. You will agree with me, science is beautiful, isn't it? Electromagnetism, asibuloi. It is science. South Africa is battling with the security of supply of electricity, which is the technology from the second industrial revolution. And we need urgent, sustainable, and reliable solutions to tackle our electricity problems. 
Now it is the time for our youth to master the art of scientifically organizing our society to increase economic production and superstition, increase economic growth, and unite our people. The third industrial revolution came about because of the invention of semiconductors in the 50s. These are materials that conduct electricity under specific conditions. Semiconductors gave us the transistor and ushered the electronic age. Transistors power our phones, computers, and televisions. Today, in our continent, we do not have a single homegrown semiconductor company, nor a computer company, nor a company that actually manufactures televisions. Now it is the time for you young people to transform the landscape of our industrial base to tackle the problems of poverty, unemployment, and inequality. As the former General Secretary of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon once noted, and I quote, <coughs> saving our planet, lifting people out of poverty, advancing economic growth, these are one and the same fight. We connect the dots between climate change, water scarcity, energy shortages, global health, food security, and women empowerment. Solutions to one problem must be solutions to all." Close quote. Now, the fourth industrial revolution is the confluence of advancement in the digital robotics and biological technologies and is catalyzed by artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a technology that makes machines intelligent and in many ways more intelligent than human beings. Because of artificial intelligence, aeroplanes are flying without pilots and cars are driving themselves. But what happens if a self-driving car actually goes and kills a pedestrian as the Uber car has actually done? AI is replacing human beings and substituting them with machines. At the University of Johannesburg, we have developed a technology that enables drones to take pictures of the earth, classify the soil, and recommend which crops should be planted at specific locations and when. We have also developed a technology that is able to use electric conductivity to screen for breast cancer and save lives. We have developed AI technology that is able to read medical images and diagnose deadly diseases such as pulmonary embolism. Now it is the time for our youth to skill themselves with knowledge in areas such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, and blockchain to tackle the problems such as exclusion, social dispersion, and foster national unity. The fourth industrial revolution is changing our economy. Just recently, Tico, Standard Bank has just laid 1,500 workers. Those who, in our country, who think that we can stop that are basically making us irrelevant in the mode of production. Just recently, Business Connections has announced that it intends to lay off 700 employees. And Goldfields also intends to lay off 1,500 workers because we are automating the mines and business processes. Everywhere, factories are shrinking and we are entering the post-work era where the nature of work will change. There are three changes that are going to happen in the fourth industrial revolution to the job market. Firstly, some jobs are going to disappear. Do you know that just 50 years ago we used to have a job called an elevator minder? This was a person who was inside the elevator to help you move from one floor to another. That job has actually disappeared. So some jobs are going to disappear. Some jobs are going to change and new jobs are going to emerge. For example, banks overseas now are hiring people with job titles called 
the chief and artificial intelligence officer. And these jobs did not exist just a few years ago. These changes in the world of work will result in the increase in inequality and poverty. How should the youth of today contribute towards resolving this situation? The fourth industrial revolution is changing the essence of our society. Technologies such as Facebook, Uber, and Twitter gather so much data from people that it is now possible for these companies to know all your moves, even the moves that you do not want your own families to know. They then harvest this data and sell this data to marketing companies that use this data to influence our decisions and optimize the bottom line. This implicit influence has serious implications on the dimensions of freedom. How can we be free if our decisions are nudged by information that was collected from social media? The youth of today must find mechanisms for preventing personal data exploitation by companies that is detrimental to society. The youth of today should have a global mindset instead of narrow nationalism. They should understand that the future of South Africa is firmly tied to the fortunes of the rest of the African continent. They should understand the problems facing Africa and craft solutions that tackle those problems. These solutions should be based on scientific principles, not superstition. At the University of Johannesburg, we have introduced the Africa by Bus project, which takes our students to the rest of the African continent by bus to expose our students to the intricacies of the African continent. These students have traveled to countries such as Mozambique, Namibia, Kenya, and Uganda. This is about 2,000 students per year. Many of them, when we actually uh, contract them to take this trip, is the first time they actually have to go to home affairs and look for the pass passport. Now it is the time for our youth to travel across the length and breadth of our continent to foster unity, collaboration, and fight xenophobia and narrow nationalism. Now it is the time for our young people to start dreaming about visiting places like Igali and Nairobi rather than London and New York. For the youth of today to succeed in the fourth industrial revolution, they should cultivate specific skills. These skills should include problem solving. With problem solving, we can find solutions to complex problems besetting our society, such as climate change, unemployment, and diseases. The other skill that is important in the fourth industrial revolution era is critical thinking skill. Critical thinking allows us to look at a problem from many different perspectives and identify proper solutions given all realities that affect us. Another fourth industrial revolution skill that is essential is creativity. In the era where information is available in abundance, the necessary skill is how to create new goods and services from such information, and this requires creativity. In the present fourth industrial revolution era, collaboration is essential. If you leave this function without having connected with at least 10 of prominent young South Africans amongst you, you are delaying our progress as a society. How are we going to solve difficult problems, such as unemployment, if you do not collaborate? Now it is the time to embed in our teaching and learning, whether as students, as workers, and just as people, 
with practices that encourage collaboration, critical thinking, and problem-solving skills to tackle serious pro problems we face in our society, such as revitalizing our urban and rural areas, reinvesting in our agriculture, and rejuvenating our health system. The problems we face as the African continent are vast, unique, and difficult, and they require the mobilization of all our motive forces, especially the youth, to think critically, creatively, and collaboratively to tackle the problems of bridging the digital divide, technological exclusion, and global alienation. The youth of today must also be innovative. Innovation depends on broad education that spans from the human sciences to the technological sciences. Those who are studying the technological uh, subjects must do human sciences, and those who are doing Human sciences must do technological sciences. When I was an undergraduate student in North America, I actually did 12 semesters of human and social sciences while I was studying engineering. One of the human uh, 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 and social sciences courses that I took was acting. I even acted in a play called My Children, My Africa. So the reason why you do not see me in Isbaya is not because of lack of talent. It is because of career choice. <laughs> the youth of today must understand matters about intellectual property. Here amongst us, Mr. Zendani Mbuba has just registered a patent which uses artificial intelligence to predict the presence of diseases and price insurance risk. Also amongst us here is Dr. Wukosi Mazivate, who was, by the way, my former student, who is educating Africans from Cape to Cairo through an organization called Deep Learning in Daba. The next one is happening in Nairobi, just in a few weeks. Now it is the time for our youth to begin to understand that knowledge can, be, can become intellectual property, which can become a product which can tackle societal challenges such as unemployment, poverty, and inequality. Education in the fourth industrial revolution should equip our youth to ask difficult questions. As Albert Einstein put it, the measure of how clever you are is not by how many questions you can answer, but by how many questions you can pose. Our educational institution must become dynamic hubs for innovative ecosystems, and this can be achieved through embedding critical thinking, collaboration, and problem-solving skills into our curriculum. Furthermore, the youth of today must understand the economy and its interdependencies with other economies. We should refrain from economically sabotaging ourselves by making reckless statements that serve no other purpose than discourage investors. When Deng Xiaoping, the leader of modern China, wanted to industrialize China, he realized that he needed foreign technology. In this regard, he established what he called the special economic zones, which had the responsibility of facilitating the transfer of technologies from the developed world to China. Now it is the time for our youth to be at the forefront of creating a conducive environment for the exchange of ideas, technology, for the benefit of our society. I leave you with the words of the former president of the United States, Barack Obama, who once said, and I quote, change won't come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we have been waiting for. We are the change we seek. Close quote. Thank you very much, Nyabonga.